John Dee was one of the most fascinating and controversial figures in the court of Elizabeth I. A mathematician, occultist, astrologer and alchemist, he acted as occasional tutor to the Queen, also casting her horoscopes. Prior to Elizabeth's ascent, he predicted the demise of Queen Mary, leading to a brief period of imprisonment. However, when Mary died, Dee was made royal astrologer. In 1564, he published Monas Hieroglyphica, a treatise explaining a glyph that he himself had created. Dee was motivated more than anything by a desire to understand the inner workings of the universe. A devout Christian, he also believed that God's plan could be discerned in numerology. However, during the last 30 years of his life, he sought answers more and more through the occult and supernatural means, bypassing the divine communion in favour of direct contact with angels and the dead. In particular, Dee practiced scrying. He was disappointed with the results, but in 1582, he met the most mysterious Edward Kelly, who seemed to have a gift for supernatural communication. From his home in Mortlock, which is now a suburb of southwest London, Dee began with Kelly a long series of angelic conversations that resulted in a stream of revelations. The angels spoke to the men in Enochian, a language supposedly used by God to communicate with Adam. The angels promised to teach this language to Dee so that he could unlock the secrets of the universe. Many texts were dictated to him in Enochian, although later on they also came in English. The language is faintly reminiscent of Hebrew, much of it is impossible to understand. Kelly and Dee spent the next six years touring in Central Europe, working on their angelic conferences and alchemy. Dee was born on the 13th of July, 1527 in London, the son of a Welshman who was a gentleman's server to Henry VIII. He was first attracted attention as a precocious 15-year-old undergraduate of St John's College, Cambridge, when he was already showing signs of the most basic qualities needed by a magician, this being self-discipline. For three years or so, Dee says, he did invariably keep this order, only to sleep four hours every night to allow meat and drink, two hours every day, and to the other 18 hours all was spent in my studies and learning. On graduating, he was appointed underreader of Greek at the newly established Trinity College, and he was later made a fellow. During his time at Cambridge, he achieved notoriety and narrowly escaped conviction for sorcery by constructing a mechanical flying beetle for a stage production of Aristophanes' Pax. It was so realistic that it terrified members of the audience who thought it was the work of the devil. Dee was fascinated by mechanics and the mathematical principles behind this science. During the two years he spent at Leuven, he included law in his studies, for recreation as he put it, and also wrote a book in 24 titles called Mercurius Colestius, never published and now lost. He visited Antwerp and the court of King Charles V in Brussels, but it was in Paris that he achieved fame, with his lectures proving so popular that many students were forced to stand outside a packed hall and listen through the windows. By this time, Dee was only 23, but even then he was being sought out by some of Europe's leading intellectuals. Returning to England, filled with inspiration from his discussions with mathematicians, philosophers, cabalists and classists, he was introduced to King Edward VI, received the patronage of the Earl of Pembroke and began, deliberately or not, his work on influencing the English Renaissance. He became close friends with the Lord Protector, the Duke of Northumberland, and became tutor to his children. But when Edward VI died, Bloody Mary ascended the throne and burned nearly 300 Protestants at the stake. Dee himself was arrested in 1555. He had drawn up astrological charts of the Queen and Princess Elizabeth and was charged with lewd and vain practices of calculating and conjuring to enchant Queen Mary. After a few months in prison, he was released without conviction. Three years later, Mary died and Dee was welcomed as Elizabeth Court as her royal astrologer. He became a favourite of the new queen who called him her philosopher and asked him to calculate the most astrologically propitious day for her coronation. A frequent visit to the palace, he was given a wide range of tasks to perform, including that of reforming the Julian calendar for England, and when an image of the queen was found in Lincoln's inn fields with a pin thrust into her heart, he counteracted any evil that might be directed towards her. Now Dee was able to pursue his fascination for magic without fear of prosecution. Over the next few years, we find him travelling often through Europe, building up his library from the flood of ancient texts or grimoires that emerged from the Reformation, and studying the languages and cryptography of the time. It was probably around this time that he started working for the spy network of his friend, Sir Francis Walsingham, in which it is suggested he was given the code 007. During this time, Dee's relationship with the Queen continued to flourish, and he dedicated his new book, written over 13 days in Antwerp in 1564, to his sovereign. It was entitled, The Monad, Hieroglyphically, Mathematically, Magically, Kabbalistically and Astrologically Explained. In the front piece, Dave wrote, Who does not understand? Should either learn or be silent? And although he had become famous, the response of the academic world was, indeed, silence. The book was largely ignored. It was during this time that Dee understood his ultimate destiny of conversing with the great beyond. 
If he was to achieve this communion, Dee decided that he would have to discover the language used by the Old Testament prophet, Enoch. Since according to the Bible, Enoch was able to talk to God directly. Kabbalistic sources stated that Enoch lived for 365 years and then became the angel Metatron. Here was proof for Dee that it was possible to speak to God even to achieve angelic status, believing that the language Enoch used had been destroyed when the Tower of Babel was burnt. He set about trying to discover it. Dee settled on scrying as the most effective way of obtaining this information. Scrying was a favourite technique of the popular magicians known as cunning folk, who plied their trade throughout Britain during the Elizabethan era, and is familiar to us in the image of the fortune teller and a crystal ball. Gazing onto a reflective surface such as a mirror or a bowl of water, the scry would report visions that revealed the whereabouts of stolen goods, the identity of thieves, or glimpses of the spirit world and its inhabitants. As Dee would see no visions when scrying himself, he began experimenting with people who claimed they possessed the skill. After limited success with several scryers, he set a man in 1582 whose destiny would be intimately entwined with his own. Edward Kelly was peculiar looking, often wearing a cowl to disguise the fact that his ears had been looped, supposedly for foraging corns. He was crippled. Furthermore, he was rumoured to have dug up corpses for use in magical practices. He was, however, gifted in the art of scrying, and while some believe he was a charlatan who tripped Dee, others feel he was an extraordinarily talented psychic, and the 20th century magician, Alistair Crowley, even claimed to be his reincarnation. Unbelieving invited to scry by Dee, he was first attempt succeeded in summoning the Archangel Uriel, dressed in purple and gold. Soon an even more powerful being, the Archangel Michael, appeared and D, magical researchers were catapulted into their top gear. The agenda for future contact with the angels was set by Michael. D was to be taught the original language of fire spoken by these celestial beings, but first a complex set of magical tables was revealed, which linked the 49 different angel functionaries to different aspects of life, such as wisdom or commerce. The minute given in each of the 49 cells of the table was extraordinary, and he copied down everything meticulously in his diary. One scrying session sent Kelly to Blockley in the Cotswolds, where he returned with a certain monument of a book on magic and alchemy. It was allegedly written by St. Dunstan, the 10th century abbot of Glastonbury, whom some believed was an alchemist. Kelly claimed to have found the book on Northwick Hill, to the northwest of Blockley, together with a quantity of red earth and a scroll containing a diagram or map of ten locations of buried treasure, of which details were given in a strange cipher. Dee quickly guessed the cipher on the scroll found by Kelly to be encrypted in Latin. On 11th of April, 1583, he broke the code, which revealed the diagram to be a table of locations of hidden treasure. Obtaining the treasure on the map was not as simple as Dee had first thought. With Kelly as Iscrier, Dee consulted the angels for advice with increasing regularity. They counseled him to avoid trouble with the law by digging up the red earth from each site, which could later, by alchemical means, be used to make gold. Little more is heard of the treasure, although some of the red earth from Norfolk Hill was used by Kelly in Prague to convince the Emperor of his alchemical powers. Dee and Kelly's working relationship was amicable, but it collapsed some years after, due to an issue in their personal lives. Kelly himself went on to Prague to seek a fortune of himself, and although the England's greatest wizard lived for another two decades, the story of Dee's final years is not a happy one. Even though the Queen had granted him a living by appointing him Warden of Christ's College of Manchester, he found the college inhospitable, and he was separated from his old home in Mortlock. Most of his friends were now very old or dead, and among his countrymen he had acquired a dubious reputation for being a conjurer of spirits. His long-suffering wife Jane died, died from the plague, as did five of their children. The death of Elizabeth in 1603 and the crowning of James I led Dee to return to London in the hope of a new beginning, but it was not to be. He died in Mortlock, 1608, or early 1609.